In this part three, we will look at construction of the embankment through to completion of the project. As the embankment is within the state of Victoria, it was Victorian State Rivers and Water Resources who were responsible for its construction. The embankment is about 1.2 kilometres long and about 200 metres wide at the base. It has a concrete core that is two metres wide at its base and embedded about two metres into solid granite bedrock. It then tapers to one metre wide at the top, just below the roadway. The inspection gallery at the bottom goes from one end of the, of the wall all the way through to the other end. Upstream, the filling was clay taken from the nearby quarry, the theory being that it was impervious to water. It was hoped that the wet clay would set like concrete when it dried, blocking water. Any water that did get through would not get past the core wall. Protection of this slope was provided by articulated concrete slabs, 300 metres thick, placed on top. They were thought to prove an extra barrier against water penetration. As we shall see shortly, it did not prove as impervious as desired. The rock face in the illustration was a later addition. The downstream fill was more porous, much of which was railed in from mines around Chilton. It was hoped that any water getting past the core wall would seep down through the coarse gravel layer on the downstream side of the core wall and be captured by drains installed below. Work started at the southern end of the valley and progressed north. As the concrete core wall advanced towards the river, earthworks were added on each side. The remedial work shown in the diagram was done in the late 20th, early 21st centuries stabilising the embankment after weak spots had been revealed. This slide shows the work in early days of construction. As with the spillway construction, a lot of material had to be excavated to, to expose bedrock. Then the two metre deep by two metre wide channel was cut in the solid rock to take the base of the core wall. We see here work progressing at the southern end of the valley. This is the inspection tunnel that runs all the way from the New South Wales side of the spillway to the southern end of the embankment. Instruments inside the tunnel, such as seismometers, monitor for any issues that may be significant. Notice too the concrete core wall in the background. It has steel reinforcing rods and a lot of steel went into the core wall. This is a nice panorama of the whole valley taken looking northeast in 1924. The trees in the distance trace the path of the Murray River. Hawke's view is the hill in the background and the quarry is on the eastern side of that hill. Hume Weir Village tops the rise. And just visible is the flying fox tower at the southern end of the spillway. That's where the embankment is headed. We can also see two steam shovels at work. This is a view looking southwest in 1925. The core wall is advancing with fill going in behind. Boxing is going in for another section of core wall. We are again looking southwest, but it's now 1927. The embankment is about 200 metres wide from side to side. On the upstream side is clay from the nearby quarry, backed up against the core wall. On the downstream side is the looser material from near Chilton. Some of the problems that threatened the embankment was due to the upstream side not being fully scraped out of loose material 
before the clay was added on top. Note Mitter Junction Village on the rise in the background. The core wall is now being prepared to slot into the tail tower. Guy wires in several directions were necessary to, to hold the flying fox tower in position. A team of three horses pulls the monkey tail scoop. Hundreds of these were used all over the Victorian side of the project, building the embankment. The soil was carried away in drays. Dray spelt backwards is yard, which is the load of soil that a dray could carry. Now the core wall is closing in on the tail tower. Note in this photo the number of horses being used. At any one time over 500 were used on the Victorian side of the project and keeping the horses well fed was a priority. In the background is the Bathanga Gap. A train with six carriages possibly carrying gravel as most concrete on the Victorian side was mixed on site. Note the men pushing trolleys along rails to the work site. They are possibly delivering cement. The core wall still has to be built to the height of the tail tower that is on the southern side of the spillway. It will eventually slot into the two metre wide groove in the tail tower, more or less like a mortise and tenon joint. They left a gap around the joint to allow for expansion and contraction and concealed the gap with bitumen, which was the best sealant available at the time. But bitumen gets brittle with age, so the seal broke down, allowing water to seep through. And this created serious problems, which required remedial action towards the end of the 20th century. This photo gives a clear understanding of what is happening at the junction of the core wall and the tail tower. The arrow points to the spillway wall behind. This is the slot in the tail tower, two metres wide. The core wall has slotted into the tail tower down here. There is another slot, also two metres wide, on this side of the tail tower for the downstream training wall to slot into. And another slot out of the upstream side for the upstream training wall to slot into. Note the concrete mixed on site. And the portable toilet. It's now 1933 and the embankment nears completion. The steel rods on the left hand side are waiting for the last pour of concrete to bring the core wall to its maximum height. These are the articulated concrete slabs, 300 millimetres thick, placed on top of the upstream side as an extra layer of, layer of protection against water penetration. Bitumen filled the gaps between the slabs. It's now later in 1933 and the core wall is complete. More fill will go over the top before the roadway is constructed. The concrete slabs are now in place. But before the end of the 1930s, a serious problem required immediate remedial work. Water had penetrated past the bitumen that was supposed to seal the gaps between slabs. The result was the slabs of concrete slid into the lake. Waves caused further damage. Rocks were quarried and dumped on the embankment to stabilise it. The embankment is now complete and the road across the top is under construction. Looking back to the south, and we can see many of the elements of construction that we have considered earlier. From the left, we can see 
the timber scaffolding with its conveyor belt that delivered tons of concrete to the site. The upstream and downstream southern training walls. The southern flying fox tower on top of the tail tower with its cable heading back to the other tower 400 metres away. The rocks or plums that make up about 17% of the spillway's volume ready for the next pour of concrete. The distilling basin now full of water and in the background the embankment heading south. In this photo finishing touches are being added with the dam getting close to being full. 1936 and the dam is complete. This is a 1947 photograph of the complete Hume Dam. It's November 1936 and a large crowd arrives for the official opening ceremony, ready to celebrate a major engineering feat 17 years after Governor General Sir Ronald Munro Ferguson turned the first sod at the same site in November 1919. A new Governor General, Lord Gowrie, performed the official opening of the dam on November 21, 1936, by pressing a button to open two of the valves. The opening was front page news across Australia. At the time, it was the largest dam in the Southern Hemisphere and the second largest in the world. The cost of the project was put at £5.6 million having blown out from the original estimate of £1.3 million. The capacity of the dam in 1936 was over 1.52 gigalitres. The capacity was later raised to over 3 gigalitres. This is the end of part three. The final part of the series will deal with other aspects of the construction of the dam, including the workers, the tools they used, work safety, the significance of the dam and some of the impacts of the dam's construction.